And a lot of people like take it um, from the perspective of us finding the kingdom of God, that's the pearl, but actually the merchant found the pearl, and that was Jesus Christ. And he sold everything he had for that pearl. So I think basically what you were seeing was that pearl worshiping. You know what I mean? With the, 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 the uh, material and stuff like that, the wind and the Holy Ghost. So, anybody else? Alright. You just never know where we're going to go. You never know. Just never, ever know. Ever. Ever. Did anybody feel um, deliverance or healing from fear? Just shake your head at me. I don't have to raise your hand. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm not... So tall. Elizabeth is so tall. Um, <laughs> I'm not... Uh, I'm not having an explorer the whole healing from a uh, fear. I know that... Oh, the name is... Um, sorry. Faith that overcomes the world. Part two. Um, I know that... There's two ways of thinking. Epigenesis had trace it, and it's fear and love. That's it. So the root of all thinking is fear or love. And they've also discovered that our brains were not designed to fear. So I really thought God was doing a work in the mind, which is part of the soul. And um, Mary Alice, you were, you were smart. You wore long sleeves to the furnace. Thank you, Lord. Uh, has anybody noticed that violence has increased in our country? Yes. Which is it, Dad? We had yesterday in the United post that um, some comments put on uh, Facebook that he wanted for the intensity of what happened in Florida that happened in San Diego. Because today, tomorrow, and Sunday, the five weekend of gays and lesbians um, walking through Kilchrist, that uh, pretty much is dominated by homosexuality. Okay, this weekend? This weekend. Oh, oh that's yeah. a harvest ground. Yeah. What uh, What times of day do you know? Um, I, well, Friday, so probably, they probably start this afternoon. Okay, but then tomorrow yeah, too? Yeah, tomorrow and Sunday they will be parading. Tomorrow and Sunday. Sunday. That little town in San Diego is pretty much, uh, it's pretty much all, all the apartments, all the condos, they're pretty much occupied by, um, by the well, in Jesus' name, there will be no violence against them. Instead, there will be uh, the violence in the kingdom of God Amen. and harvesters in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I just want you guys to know something so you're not caught off guard. Summer, uh, spring and summer is a time of war. Um, in, uh, I think it's 2 Samuel 6, 5 or 6, so after David got comfortable in his kingdom and um, he surveyed all that God had given him and uh, and he gave, you know rested in his victories and then it says that uh, when uh, he stayed home when kings were supposed to go out to war and uh, that's when he um, had the affair with Bathsheba and uh, so you don't want to be warring when it's a period of rest you don't want to be resting when it's a period of war. But the even higher way is to war from a place of rest. Mm -hmm. And so um, just recognize that. Recognize violence, anger, things like that. Just the temperature outside is the same thing. And also it's the season of the year in which um, the spirit of lust will rear its head because a lot of people unclothe because it's hot. And uh, so just recognize that, be on guard. Um, I was hearing that in the spirit when we were doing worship. Hi, Bob. I'm sure it's nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, so I want to continue. Um, last week. On faith that overcomes the world. And it's funny because Elizabeth was singing about walking on water and we're going to talk about Peter. A lot of people give Peter a bad rap. No one else got out of the boat. 
They really walked on water. I haven't walked on water. So uh, I think Peter needs some honor here. But Moses, like we talked about last week, and I highly suggest that you watch the videos um, on uh, the YouTube channel, but Moses had a uh, zeal and a bravado minus wisdom in that he killed the Egyptian because he felt the call. So we talked about that. And we talked about between the call and the commission, there's a testing and a training and a character work that occurs. So you're, you're in this tension of wanting to go into the next season of your destiny, but you're not yet ready. And so it's almost like chomping at the bit. Well, then life occurs and, and, and decisions made without wisdom happen. And so then what, what usually happens is you retreat to the back side of the desert. So when we talk about that, he didn't even go to the desert. He went to the back side. So I don't even know where that's at. I just know he was somewhere far away from his old life. And he became so comfortable in that that when God showed up in the burning bush, he said, okay, now I need you to, you know, set my people free. Uh, he's like, who, me? <laughs> Why don't you send somebody else? And so for some of you, uh, the answer has been not yet. And you've kind of wondered if maybe you didn't hear it correctly, uh, are you truly called to what you thought you were called, things like that. Um, so just recognize that if you're in that tension, the wisdom of God will allow you to not um, prematurely step into something that you're not yet ready for, basically. So now I'm going to look at Peter, because Peter is the best example of zeal and bravado who about any wisdom. And Peter is also, and some of you need to know this, he was a perfect picture of thinking he knew who he was, and he had no idea what was on the inside of him. See, a lot of times, as Christians, we either think we're farther ahead than we are, or we beat ourselves up and think we're not as far ahead as we should be. And it really depends on your, I think, personality. You know, people are very confident. They think that everything they hear is from God, and every decision they make is from God, and Everything they say is anointed. But if you have some people that they're talking to, they're like, no, that's not the case. And then you got people that are very introverted, introspective. They're always thinking, man, I'm just not where I should be. I'm this age. I should be farther along. I mean, like all this stuff occurs. Okay? So Peter was the more confident type. He uh, tended to be the leader. And I remember uh, uh, years ago, I was crossing um, the street at a seventh and prince i was mad something happened and i was like ticked and uh, the lord said you're just like peter you cut off somebody's ear then i had to heal it and uh so at first like i don't want to be like peter you mind you what do you mean i'm like peter so i was like mad about that and but then i started looking at peter's life he's the one that got the revelation that you are the christ the son of the living god he was the one that said uh uh, Father, or Jesus, if it's you, command me to come out of the boat and I'll walk on water. I mean, he was the one who made huge mistakes, but he had huge victories. Okay? <clears throat> so let's look at Mark 14, 27. Father, we thank you for your word. And I said it goes in to our hearts and brings revelation that stays with us for the rest of our lives. Where's Margie? Oh, there you are. I'm hiding. <laughs> I can't even hide. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, work. <coughs> Chris, you forgot her charger and her CDs. <laughs> so if someone can remind me, I forget them. All right, Mark 14, 27. Weird. <laughs> huh. It says, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, 
I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even if everybody else stumbles, I will. Okay? So Jesus, you know, the thing with Peter is he was so vocal. So everything that occurred had occurred in front of everybody. You know what I mean? Like everybody had to see it. So Jesus, he said to him, he said, I assure you, I am not kidding around, is basically what that means, that I say to you this day, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. But then he's like, no, if I had to die with you, I will not deny you. And everybody else said the same thing. So he really did. He really believed it. He was not kidding around. He thought that he was strong enough in character and strong enough in like zeal and love and um, closeness for God. And he was probably a big dude uh, that there was no way he was going to fall. And then the Lord did something very interesting to make it even more weird. Remember he told him, he said, grab the sword. Isn't that interesting? So he says, grab the sword. And I never understood it. Uh, until Dr. Harfish explained it. The apostles were not born again yet. Okay, we talked about that. They, the law was until John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said. Everything, the law has been until the last prophet, which was John the Baptist, of the old covenant. Jesus came to make a new covenant. They had faith in him. They knew he was the Christ by revelation, but their old nature was still there. They didn't have any nature yet because Christ had not yet gone away and sent his spirit. Remember, he says, more profitable to you that I go away so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people, a lot of scholars believe in John 20, he's been resurrected. Uh, here it is. In John chapter 20, 19 through 23, they believe that that is where they were born again. Because then he says, uh, in verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit had not yet come until Acts chapter 1. Excuse me, 50 days later. So, what was happening here? It's the same picture of Adam being lovingly formed by Father God, and then him breathing his spirit into Adam, and he became a living soul. So when the Lord breathed on them, they became living souls. In other words, they received his nature because he had been resurrected at this point. Then later, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you might be like, well, if they weren't born again, then how did they do all the miracles? How did they operate in all this stuff? It was borrowed anointing. Remember, Jesus said, uh, authority is going to be given to me, so I'm going to give it to you, and I want you to go out two by two, heal the sick, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers, don't take your purse with you, don't take your money bag with you, just let people take care of you. When you show up at a house and they receive your peace, who will not take a devil with you? Okay? And so they were not borrowed anointing. So the Lord told them to bring a sword because for 10 days they were going to be vulnerable. He was going to be gone. They didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. They were born again. They didn't have the power of God yet. So they needed protection. And so he gave them the sword. Well, Peter used it to cut off an ear. And Jesus had to put it back on. Now, and you know, what's interesting is they say, when Peter did that, because uh, he's not a lot for you, right? When Peter did that, it was the high priest's servant, which meant that Peter would have been crucified. So when he put it back on, it was with force. Like he was pressing it back into his head. That's what the Greek means. So, also keep in mind that John or uh, Judas did the same miracles that the other 11 apostles did. And so when the Lord said, do you come to me as a friend and kiss me? Is that how you're going to do this? I believe Judas, he could have 
stopped everything as far as his role, but he didn't. Instead, he had what's called remorse, not repentance. And remorse is where you're sorry for what you did, but you had no intention to stop. And so he did not apologize. Instead, he had remorse. It was all about him, and he ended up committing suicide. Peter, on the other hand, he repented. So let's look. Uh, well, before we get to that part, I want to read the statement to you. <coughs> we see Peter's bravado and zeal that he had mistaken his faith. I want you all to hear that because I see it happen with Christians. He mistook his bravado and his zeal for God as faith. Faith does not need to be worked up. Faith is a state of being. It's present tense. Now faith is the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can yell at the devil all you want. You can yell at your body. You can yell at your finances. You can go into all of this zeal. But if you do not have faith in your heart, you know what's happening? You're making yourself tired. Faith is present tense. When you speak it and you realize that you have faith, when you speak the words, it's with assurance and they carry power. Okay? own strength. Luke 22. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. You know how you can tell a message is really important? It's hard to focus. I want you guys to examine your hearts because what I'm going to show you tonight can literally keep you from falling. Sometimes the enemy knows us better than we know ourselves. And he knows how to go into those areas and make us so confident that we think we're confident in the Lord, but we're actually confident in our own abilities. And we're confident in our own knowledge. So what happens is something big occurs that we don't know how to handle. And if we're not careful, we'll get offended with God. If we're not careful, we'll turn away. Oh, this is what it means following you. I was better off before I got born again. We'll turn into people that complain about everything. You know how I can tell a person is in uh, doubt and unbelief? Everything out of their mouth is a problem. Everything out of their mouth is everything that's wrong on the outside. And this is important. They're looking for an answer outside of themselves instead of doing what they're supposed to do, which is be in the Word, be in prayer, and be in worship. And another thing I see, people that are in doubt and unbelief are always going from person to person to person to person trying to find an answer when the answer is in the Word of God. So God don't believe you harden the heart. And you don't have any zeal for the word of God. Does that make sense? So you have to watch that. You have to be very careful. The enemy knows. He can smell fear. He can smell doubt and unbelief. He recognizes faith. He knows what it is. Seven sons of Sceva. Oh, this name of Jesus name must be some magical cure. Let's, let's go to the most demon-possessed man in the city of Ephesus and let's cast those demons out. Because these Christians are doing it. We're exorcists. We can do it too. So they show up in the house and aggravate the demons inside of the guy. Just keep going at them. What? Zeal and confidence in their own ability. They go in there. They keep biting this guy. And what happens? The demon says... Jesus, I know, 
In other words, I know intimately who he is. I know he's the son of God. I know what's going on here. But then he goes, and Paul, Paul I know. In other words, I've investigated him. I'm recognizing something in Paul that reminds me of Jesus. In fact, this is the Greek. I'm giving you the Greek. I've sent out demonic spies to watch Paul because he's a threat. So Jesus, I know. He's the son of God. Paul, I know because I've been investigating him. You, I don't know who you are. And so he got violent, you know, beat him up, took their clothes, had him around the house, butt naked, in front of the entire city of Ephesus. And legend has it, I don't know if it's true, but Paul, when he heard what happened, guess what? He went to the house and he had business. Can't verify because it's not in the scriptures, but that's what some ancient writings have said. So he recognizes faith. He also recognizes bravado. Okay? Have you ever done that? Where you're like, man, I've got it, and you just go after it, and nothing happens? Right? And you're like, what the heck was that? But if you look in your heart, you know you really didn't have faith. You were trying to work something up. Okay? So when you get into striving, you have ceased from faith. Whether it's emotion, mental, work, uh, prayer, worship, whatever it is, when you get into striving, you have stepped outside of faith. So this is what happened. So in Luke 22, 54, it says, the Lord's arrested. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. The only one that did not scatter was John. You know why? Have you ever thought about it? Look. He was the one that laid his head on the Lord's chest and heard his heartbeat. He's the one that he would write in his book, The Apostle Whom Jesus Loved. <laughs> I love it. He's the one that actually Peter and him, they, mm, they butt heads. See, John was called the son of thunder. He had a temper on him. He had anger on him. But when he got in the presence of the Lord, all that began to be transformed and changed. So he became the apostle of love. And so when, when Peter's restored to see, he's like, well, what about this one? And he points back to John. And the Lord's like, what, what is this to you, John? You know, you just focus on what I told you. So there was some competition there. But John didn't leave him because he operated in love. So it says he, he was arrested, Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain slave girl, not a soldier, wasn't a cop. It was a little girl. Seeing him as he sat by the fire, he looked in, she looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. And after a little while, another song said, Yeah, you're also with them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And then after about an hour it passed, another colleague in the firm said, Yeah, uh -huh, this guy, I know. I know he was with them. For he's about to land. But Peter said, Man, I don't even know what you're talking about. So then immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now here's the thing. All the apostles are there. John, he tried to go wherever the Lord went, but there were times where he couldn't enter the room. All of them, guys, saw what Peter just did. All of them heard what Jesus told him he was going to do. They watched the whole thing play out. Have you ever been that humiliated? I haven't, not to that degree. Okay? So he denies him. Guys, Peter loved him so much that uh, when the Lord said, I'm going to go and I'm going to be arrested, he said, no, 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 you're not going to be arrested. That's not going to happen to you. And then the Lord said, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. What that meant is Peter's affection for the Lord was so strong that he got out of his spirit and into his soul. 
In other words, he came out of the anointing and into his soul, and his love for him became a selfish love in that he didn't want God's plan to be fulfilled because he would lose something he loved. So in his human nature, he loved him dearly. So I, I want you to feel that. I want you to feel what he felt like, if you can, to a degree. When the Lord looked at him, right after he did it, another account says that right that moment the Lord looked at him. <coughs> and he began to cry. And he left. So everybody knew he denied him. Everybody had heard the prophecy. And maybe you've experienced failure. Maybe you've experienced embarrassment. Maybe you've experienced humiliation. And maybe not even for righteousness sake. Maybe you've just done some things that you wish you hadn't done. Or people have said some things about you that you wish they wouldn't have said. But I'm here to tell you tonight that it's time to come out of hiding. And a lot of times we hide behind insecurities. A lot of times we hide behind fears. A lot of times we hide behind uh, bravado and zeal. So I want you to understand that it's time for you to come out of that hiding and be who you were called to be. And you know the number one thing that we hide behind? Anger. Whenever I was hurt, I was angry. Some people hide behind anxiety and depression. And depression is simply anger turned inward. Okay? So they hide behind that. But God is peeling layers away. That's what he began last week. And those that have ears to hear, you will go into a new level of confidence in your destiny and confidence in your call. So that's why I suggest you listen to last week. Be obedient to the call of God on your life. Now here's the next thing that will happen. The very next thing that will happen whenever... Um, uh, you have an embarrassment or you have something that happens as a failure. Look at John 21. John 21, 3 through 19. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. <clears throat> now we know that Peter was a fisherman before Jesus Christ. So whenever you have a failure, what happens? You go back to what you're used to. See, the Lord will begin to push you. <laughs> he'll, he'll push you closer and closer to the cliff. And as He pushes you, He demands a response from you. And it can be business, it can be relationships, it can be spiritual, it can be praying for someone at Walmart. Okay? So He'll push you, and you can either resist Him, have <laughs> this whole... Uh, they go on, or you say, okay, I got it. I got it. I'll just jump. Now, I want those of you that have um, taken the plunge, so to speak, in the past. I want you to think back. That scared you one. Whether it's praying for somebody, new job, new business, whatever it is, think back to it. Okay? Now, and I'm talking about when you're obedient to Holy Spirit, not when you're like, doo -doo -doo -doo, and you kind of like stumble off the cliff. I'm talking about, you know, it's God, okay? Did it all work out? See, the only time it doesn't work out is when we either thought we heard God and we didn't, we live on our own understanding, or we prematurely do something we're not supposed to do. It's not yet time. So if you've done something that it has not worked out, it's not God's fault. The disconnect happened somewhere, but it wasn't with him. And so God, it's like, uh, I remember years ago, it was the most boring class ever. We had to do these classes at this church I went to, and I was like, you know, trying to keep my eyes open. But the guy said something that was amazing. He goes, the way people look at evangelism is like, they feel like they're jumping off of a cliff. There's so much fear. You know, they got to just, you know, jump off. He said, but actually all you're doing is jumping off a curb. <laughs> it stuck with me. I'm like, oh, that's good. That's good. The only thing I remember. I have anything that man said. So a lot of times, what seems the most overwhelming and scary to us is where your next level of prosperity and blessing is. <coughs> so what happens? You jump off. You go with it. 
And then all of a sudden, all hell is unleashed. And I'm talking, you know, you got people yelling at you for no reason. Stuff starts breaking. Things start happening. Relationships start falling apart. Demons start manifesting everywhere. You feel insecure in your knowledge. You feel insecure in, in, in who you are to do this. Like, I don't even know how to do this. How am I supposed to do this? That's called the middle. Okay? Because it's real exciting at the beginning, and it's really, really exciting at the end, but it's the middle part that, I'm just going to be quite frank with you, it sucks. Okay? That's where the enemy tries to get people to quit. But if you will keep going, in fact, all the hell that has been unleashed against you and all the insecurities that are coming up, if you will simply keep on walking, don't stop, don't look back, you can take it as a sign that you're headed the right direction. Do you think anybody's going to care if you're going the wrong way? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, go ahead. <laughs> you know, most of us are like, ooh, but this way, okay? He doesn't care. But when you're going the right direction, when all that stuff starts to happen to you, you know. Yeah. You know. And what did the Lord tell Peter? He said, when you are strengthened, when you're restored, I want you to strengthen your brother. So he was going to be restored back to leadership. Let me tell you, being a leader in falling, that takes you to a whole nother level. Because Peter was a leader of all of them. And you know what I find very ironic? After the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because God is so funny. You know, John was always, you know, Peter thorn in the side. He got to lay on his breast while he's sitting there watching him. You know, sissy. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. Who are the two that begin to minister immediately? Peter and John. They're praying together. They're eating together. They're doing all those kinds of, kind of things together. Why? Because he got the Holy Spirit, right? So Peter's a leader. He falls. That's funny. And, uh, and he says, I'm going fishing. <coughs> and they're like, we're going too. So they went out and immediately got in the boat. Didn't catch them. <coughs> but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples didn't notice him. That's the second key. Often, the Lord is standing right there with your blessing, with your provision, but you don't see him. Because he comes in forms that require discernment in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any food? And they said, No. And he said, Well, cast it on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they did. And they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. <coughs> Anything God has had me do, He's either like shot me out of nowhere or He's tricked me. I'm serious. So, basically, because he obeyed his voice, but they didn't yet recognize him. Have you ever been in that part? Is this Holy Spirit? Is this not? I don't know what to do. Is this him? Is this not him? Right? But they obeyed the voice, and they caught an abundance of fish. Now, the minute they did that, this is what John says. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he removed it, and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in a little boat. We see Peter just running off like usual. And uh, they were dragging the net behind the two fish, or with all the fish. Verse 9, Then as soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish lay on it, and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went out and dragged the net to land with a large fish. Now, I want you to picture what happened. He's denied the Lord three times. He's been humiliated in front of all of his peers. He goes back to what he used to know, and it's not successful. It dries up. Like all of a sudden, the fish are like, oh, Peter's going to go away. Okay? Okay? And then the Lord shows up, and so in his exuberance to see him, he jumps in the boat, takes off running, and stops. 
Because he remembers what he did. The enemy or your woundedness, when you realize where you've been, will sometimes stop you from pressing in. So he stopped, and it was awkward. Well, what do I do now? You know, I denied him, he saw me come. You know, he's probably having all these thoughts and emotions going on in his mind. And then the Lord said, well, go ahead and bring the net over, because he gave him something to do. So they bring the net over, and they had large fish, 153. There were so many, but the net wasn't broken. And Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew he was the Lord. Jesus then came and he took the bread and gave it to him and the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples. How many times did Peter deny? So this is his hour of restoration. Remember how I told you guys last week that when the Lord was resurrected, this is his kindness. The kindness of the Lord leads you to repentance. His kindness was, go tell the disciples and <coughs> Peter. That's what he said. Go tell the disciples, but make sure, disciples, disciples, but make sure you tell Peter. Peter was on his mind. He wanted to restore him. He knew the pain. <coughs> the reason he knew the pain is because he took it on the cross. He knew exactly what Peter was feeling. And so he said, make sure you tell Peter. So here we are, the hour of restoration. So they're eating breakfast. I don't know if it was awkward. You know, they ask him, so how was it in heaven? Where were you those three days? <laughs> See the enemy or anything? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Parade him through the, you know, heavenlies, completely embarrassed. I mean, we don't know. We don't know what the conversation was or if they even talked because it might have been a little weird. So when they eat breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah. Now that's significant. He said to him, Simon, son of Jonah. Do you know what Jonah means? One of the original meanings is drunkard. So basically, Jesus called Peter son of an alcoholic. Now that's his real name. That's, that's his real name. It was his old name. So what's he doing? He's confronting the old nature. See, we think that we can do stuff sometimes and maybe hide it. You know, but it's not there. Just continue as is with the Lord, like nothing happened. But no, he'll come to you and he'll confront you. And what happened? Because he wants it dealt with because he knows the little foxes spoil the vineyard. He knows that when you have a conscience that has guilt on it, you can't pray in faith. He knows that when you're not confident and secure in your relationship with him, nothing's going to happen. So he confronted his own nature. Emmanuel. He confronted it. He confronted his old nature and said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? So what he was doing is he was going back to the place where Peter said, well, all of these people can uh, forsake you, but I'm not going to. And the implication was that he loved the Lord and everybody else did. Right? So now he's like, he calls him by his own name. He says, do you really love me more than all these? In other words, did they betray me? Some of the most powerful, life-transforming encounters I've had with God is when He's come in my face and confronted what I did and did not miss any words. He'll do that. He'll confront it. He wants everything exposed and everything made plain. That way, not to shame you, but so that he can cut that away. So that he can get rid of that so that you can continue into the next level. So I want you to understand, between the call and the commission, you're going to have a bunch of cutting. A bunch of pruning. Okay? A bunch of confrontation that he's going to do in your life. He's going to confront fear. He's going to confront uh, uh, bad attitudes. He's going to confront all of those things. He's going to confront God. You think you're super spiritual? Okay. Let's talk about this. Right? 
So he says, you let me more than these? And he says, yes, Lord. That's so funny. He's still, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Now, I want you to know something here. The word love, where he said to Peter, do you love me, is agape. Where Peter said, you know I love you, is phileo. It's not agape. Phileo is brotherly affection. Agape is God love. It can only come from him. Peter thought that his phileo was God love. And we talked about that, remember, in the Reformation Center. If we're not aware of our level of love, we will actually end up offended and betrayed on. And, and the enemy can twist it. See, God love, the enemy can't touch. He can't touch that. But for Leo, he can. Let me give you an example. Have you ever heard people say, I know I shouldn't give my drug-addicted child money, but I don't want them to not talk to me. Now you tell me, was that phileo or agape? Phileo. Yeah. Because the affection that they have for their child has been turned back to where they now fear losing that. Okay? And so he said, I have affection for you. That was okay. Um, we're going to stay there, but in 1 Peter. So Peter, he learned this. Oh, I'm in 2 Peter. Yeah. In 2 Peter, he said, in verse 7 of chapter 1, he's talking about adding to your faith this, and to this, that, and that, this, blah, blah. And then he says in verse 7, to godliness add brotherly kindness, or phileo, and then to brotherly kindness, love. So he knew there was a, a, a ladder, a staircase toward perfection. So God is okay with phileo love if that's all you've got right now. What he's not okay with is you thinking that phileo love is agape. Let me give you another example. Well, I love God and he knows my heart. So, um, it's, you know, I mean, me and my boyfriend, we live together. We live like married people, but God, love, you know, I love God. The Bible is plain. If you love him, you do what he says. There is no voting process in the kingdom of God. You can't say, oh, I don't agree with that. You can't do it. So you have to understand that a lot of people love God the same way that they love pizza and ice cream. Are y'all getting this? So you need to recognize the level of love you have, and if it's at phileo, that's okay. Uh, oh, uh, say it, Peter one seven. Thank you. In other words, just be honest with where we're at, okay? So then he says, verse sixteen of John twenty one, and he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Agape. And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo or have affection for you. And he said, Well, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time. Why a third time? Because he did not eat for you. Yes. He was rolling it back. Okay? So he said to him a third time, Simon said, Jonah, do you have affection for me? At that point, it's phileo. The Lord was happy to meet him with where he was at as long as it was honest. God wants truth in the inner man. So if you know that you're not to that place, don't fake it until you make it. Sometimes there's things you have to do that. But when it comes to your relationship with God, we ain't going anybody. He knows, right? So he says, okay, do you have affection for me? So then he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I have affection for you. And he said, feed my sheep. When you're in a place of restoration, or when God shows you where you're really at, and I ask him to do that to me all the time. Lord, please show me where I really am. I don't want to think that I'm farther ahead than I am. I don't want to think that I'm behind when I'm not. I want to know exactly where I'm at. Do you have anything that we need to talk about? 
Do you have anything we need to discuss that I've done that is not your will? And, um, and, and I recommend that for everybody because you know why leaders fall? Because they don't know themselves or they ignore things and then guess what? The enemy lets them do. He lets them influence hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people. Why? Because every time the leader falls, the sheep scatter. So the enemy's just fine with you going decades, saving people, building churches, having a TV ministry, all that stuff, because he's waiting for the opportune time when he can cause the most damage to the most people. Huh? Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> now, this is how human nature is. <laughs> so in verse 20 of 21, so then Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Following, but also leaned on his breast as, you know, supper. And said, Lord, who is the one, who is the one, who is the one who betrays you? And Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said, if I will that he remain till I come, what's that, what's that to you? You follow me. He ends comparison. One of the good indications that you're not where you think you are, or that you're not where you, yeah. I just got myself confused. Is if you're comparing yourself. Comparison is of the flesh. Paul talked about that. We're almost done. <clears throat> So here's what's happening. And Yolanda can tell you this because she sees people do it probably all the time because she's a counselor. Not for all time, He was deflecting. When the Lord begins to dig around in your business, you either deflect or you get angry. So he's deflecting. He's like, man, there's enough tension on me. I can't handle this. What about this guy? He's like, listen to you. You follow me. Beware of that. Especially in relationships. When you have someone that's telling you something, then you deflect. Well, you do this. <laughs> that is deflecting. Okay? Then I've had people where I told them something, and they want to shoot the messenger. And you know what's really funny? When they ask me, and then I tell them, and they want to shoot the messenger. So sometimes it's a little intense when God is exposing and opening things up that no one else sees. If you will deal with your stuff in private, guess what? You don't have to do it in public. He's not out to shame you. He's not out to expose you. He's just trying to get you to deal with your stuff. And if you won't, then all of a sudden, you know, people start confronting it. Okay? And I've had that happen before. It's very unpleasant, I must say. So he's embarrassed, he tries to deflect. Here's my advice to you. When God restores you, just say thank you and shut up. <laughs> I'm serious. Thank you, Lord, for revealing that to me. And just be quiet and move on. Don't get into all that other business. All right. One final thing. This will blow you away. Do you know the Lord stepped out before it was yet his commission? That he was God. That <coughs> he was man. 13 year old actually. 13 or 12. The Lord showed me this. I never saw this before. When I was preparing this, he said, I want to show you something. So he had me go there. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's Jesus. You know? Alright, so Luke 2 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mama did not know. Uh-uh. But supposing him to have been <clears throat> in the company, they traveled the whole day. And they sought him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Have you ever lost a child? Like in the store? Ooh. It's a bad feeling. Okay, so they probably were not very happy. Now it was, uh, so, after three days, again, three days, 
They found them in the temple, sending them to the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they, his parents, saw him, they were also amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, me and your dad, we've been looking for you anxiously. And he said, well, why were you looking for me? Did you know I have to be about my father's business? Twelve years old. And they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them, but he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus is and was sinless. He did not sin here. <clears throat> so here's something I want you to take out or take it with you tonight. Stepping out prematurely is not a sin. Okay, so don't worry about that. But recognizing it's not yet time and subjecting yourself to the authority of God will actually lead to an increase in wisdom, stature, and favor. So if you're operating in the right timing, you will mature to these things and all of a sudden the right people will be brought into your life for you to fulfill your destiny. If Jesus would have stayed in a premature spot, he would have been in rebellion. Okay? That's where he would have sinned. So don't beat yourself up if you step out prematurely. And don't let it produce fear in you, making you want to hide and not ever step out again. Then at 30, you receive his commission about water baptized, baptize, receive the Holy Ghost, and after testing from every single demon, and then the finally the evil one, you receive his anointing. And so let's finish. Hebrews 11, 26 through 27. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater richer, riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looking to the reward, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. This is how you keep faith when you're in the middle. Looking forward to the end. That's how you stay. You gotta keep the vision before you. You gotta keep what God has told you. You gotta keep the things and the promises He's made to you in front of you. If you don't, you'll quit. Okay? So